And my clock says we just hit six o'clock. So, Mr. Greg Dixon, do we begin with you? Sure thing. Thank you, okay. Steve. Okay, dropping out. All right. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, real quick, my name is Greg Dixon, and I am currently serving as the chair of the Pacific Northwest section of the Audio Engineering Society. And I'm really pleased um, to be able to keep these meetings going with our section. Um, and as I said, I'm really honored for everybody that's here. Thank you for being here. Um, I have a few announcements that I need to make concerning upcoming meetings and about a little bit about the format tonight as well. Um, first of all, um, we're here to listen to JJ Johnston, who will be giving a presentation on auditory mechanisms for spatial hearing, as you can see. Um, we're really excited to know that today in attendance, we have people from 25 states in the United States, four Canadian provinces, and 12 different countries. Uh, we welcome each and every one of you and um, thank you for being here. With respect to moderation, um, while JJ is presenting tonight, we would like to ask that you type questions for JJ in the chat. And we have a couple moderators who will be helping us um, interrupt JJ from time to time at a, at, a, at a good time when we can ask JJ those questions from you. So once again, if you have questions um, for JJ about his presentation, please post those into the chat. And I wanted to clarify, I actually need some clarification from the committee. While JJ is presenting tonight, um, are we supposed to make sure that we mute our microphones? on Zoom? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so just another reminder, please, for everybody. We are recording this meeting. If you if you came in late, we made that announcement just a bit ago. So if you don't want um, video of your face potentially being on a YouTube video, please can, please mute your camera in order, in order for that to occur. In addition, because we are recording the meeting, uh, we want to make sure that we can have it as quiet as possible so that we can understand JJ and also that the recording turns out as best as we can make it. So please, while JJ is presenting, mute your microphone. And if you have questions for JJ, please don't interrupt JJ. Post those questions in the chat and our moderators will help um, JJ answer those questions. After the meeting this evening, which will take about an hour and 15 minutes of time approximately, um, we are going to ask that all of you stick around and have uh, some time where we can kind of meet and greet one another um, and have um, time for short introductions so we can get to know you as well. I look forward to getting to know each and every one of you later on this evening. I'd also like to make a special announcement that next month we have an exciting meeting planned with mastering engineer Bob Olson. Um, and this is going to take place on February 23rd, uh, 6 p.m. Pacific, uh, Pacific time. And I wanted to invite Bob, who we're very lucky to have here at the meeting tonight, to say a few words about uh, what he's going to be talking about next month. Um, so, Bob? Oh, boy. Uh, what am I going to talk about? Well, what little I can remember. <laughs> it, uh, I wanted to talk about the, the industry in general at that time and what we were trying to do, what I thought was absolutely brilliant about how the company worked. And I think- Can you how, let us know where you worked, Bob? Some yeah. People I, not know. Oh, okay. I was at Motown Records in Detroit. In what years? From 1965 to 1972. Those were good years. Yeah. What'd you do there? Yeah, I did. Started in mastering and then got thrown out of my little nerd cave into the studio and I before I was done, I'd had just about every recording engineering job in the place. 
Is there something behind you there? Yeah, that's that's the studio and about that's the control room wall in about 1968. Sweet. There's going to be more next week, next month. Fantastic. Thank you, Bob, for saying a few words about that. And I also I neglected to mention that the name of the presentation, which would have clued you all in, is going to be called Motown in the studio where it happened. So we're really excited to be able to um, have Bob speak next next month. Thank you, Bob. OK. Uh, now I'd like to turn the time over uh, to Dan Mortensen to tell us a little bit about the initiative that he has going on that's um, a part of the Pacific Northwest AES. And it's a event that uh, is hosted every weekend, from what I understand. And it's called Tea Time Topics. So, Dan, could you tell us a little bit more about what you're up to? Yeah, thanks, uh, Greg. I'd be happy to. So what this is called is Tea Time Topics because it occurs at my time for tea. And we start at 3.30 in the afternoon Pacific time uh, in Seattle. And uh, we talk about whatever sound topic we want to, audio topic, and we go off topic sometimes too. And the, the point is for people to be able to present to other people something that they're real excited about. And this next Saturday is our 33rd uh, meeting since May. And uh, it's gonna be, uh, I think there's two topics. And one of them that I can talk about is gonna be David Sherman and Bill Hanley. Uh, Bill did the sound at Woodstock and at Newport Folk Festivals and Jazz Festivals. and is really the father of big scale concert sound. And he'll be talking with David Shearman, who is a former chair of this section and former president of the AES and worked for JBL and a bunch of other companies as well. They're gonna talk about the Woodstock reunion in 1999, where there was the riot and the burning of lots of PA gear and uh, that kind of stuff. And David has a bunch of pictures of that because they were both there. And uh, so that's this Saturday and it's free. Um, if, you're, if you want to come to it, you should send me your email address. Uh, send it to me in the chat here, uh, a, a private message to me and I'll send you the Zoom link. And uh, we go from 3.30 till seven and it's so much fun that it's difficult to get people to stop and we keep going and I tr we try to be done by 7.15, but uh, whatever, it's, it's really fun and uh, you get to meet people and, and I encourage you to come uh, to stay tonight and do the self-introductions because that's kind of what it, the tea time thing grew out of is hearing the many fun things that people do in audio. And uh, I, I love that and uh, hang out tonight, please. So thanks, Greg. Our, question, are previous uh, topics up on YouTube yet? There are a few meetings on my YouTube channel and I'll send that I'll send a link to that to the chat here to everybody uh, which just ha has those plus a bunch of other audio <laughs> audio uh, recordings of people coughing and stuff uh, but uh, Sorry, no, seriously videos of people so there's interviews with Don Palouse and Frank Laco that I did and uh, others as well and some meetings by JJ and a really great video that we did of the uh, Harry Parch musical instruments collection, uh, which is fascinating and has 30 some thousand views now. So you're a treasure, Dan. Thank you. Very oh, yeah. Much Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to echo that. Thank you so much, Dan, for all that you do to help help these initiatives go and, and keep going and um, offer us a, a chance to be together as a community each week. That's really great. Um, I did want to make one last announcement before I turn the time over um, to Steve to introduce JJ. Um, and that is that the Pacific Northwest uh, section of the AES, each year we have an election. Um, and May is, I'm sorry, June is going to be the election date. 
And on May of this year, we will be making our announcements of the slate of candidates um, that we will be voting for at our election. And I believe that um, we will be making some announcements in the near future about openings and um, things like that. But we would like to encourage anyone um, that's in the Pacific Northwest area that is interested in potentially becoming a part of our committee and helping with this organization to consider running uh, for a position. Um, and in particular, we, we, we want to point out that we want to um, be able to bring people into the committee of all walks of life and, and, and a dev, a dev, a dev, excuse me, a, a, dev, ah, a de diverse range I'm stammering tonight for some reason. Probably need some sleep. But a diverse range of people into our community here. And we want to encourage anybody that um, feels like that they have something to offer this group the opportunity to be able to run. And I encourage um, you, if you're interested in be becoming a part of this committee, um, to do so. All right. Um, I think that those are all the announcements that need to be made, unless I've forgotten anything. Sounds good. Okay. Great. Okay, I'm going to turn the time over to Steve Turnage, who will be helping um, introduce our guest speaker tonight, JJ Johnston. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Well, if you don't know who JJ is, you'll know after tonight. If you do know who JJ is, then you, you, you can read the front pages. Uh, I'd like, JJ is primarily responsible, among other things, for like the MP3 format and other aspects of, of, of rather terrible things, but it is not his fault. I just want to make sure that that's known. Uh, among other things, he's, he's, I probably learned more from him about uh, hearing than any other human, and we're about to hear more about that tonight. And so without further ado, let me please introduce James J.J. Johnston. Go for it. Okay. So this, I call this auditory mechanisms or spatial hearing. I'm not going to go into so much how you do virtualization or things like that, because first we need to do a little bit of repeat of what the ear can actually detect so that you know what you actually might be able to resolve between one ear, two ears, and so on. So uh, just a few uh, first off questions in chat anytime. Um, I may be able to see it, I may not. Steve will interrupt if I don't see it. Um, I may ask you to hold off for a second with a question. Um, and I'm not going to go into high a high level of detail. That's gigabytes of data. I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> so with that warning, let's talk about first we have one ear. The first thing we have to remember is the ear is frequency sensitive. The ear, the cochlea, basically is a filter bank. It filters the sound that comes in through your eardrum into what some people call a set of bands. It's really a highly overlapping set of bands. There's about somewhere around 3,500 um, detector arrays. And there's about, if you stack bandwidths end to end to end, there's about 35 bandwidths. So there's about 100 detectors in each filter bandwidth that go from, well, take your choice, low frequency to high frequency or vice versa. The interesting thing is when the ear is considered, the high frequencies are detected right by the entrance to the cochlea. The low frequencies are detected all the way at the other end. Um, and the filter bank is unlike any kind of filter bank that signal processors thinks of. And the detectors come after the filter structure. So this is important to remember that whatever you detect has been basically sent through a filter bank. So what happens at 100 hertz and what happens at 400 hertz may be completely unrelated or maybe not depending on the input waveform. And just to make this point, the filter mechanism on the basal membrane is very well supported in the 
both the literature and in experiments nowadays, even though I was surprised to hear some people don't actually seem to accept that idea yet, it's very clear that that's, if not the exact details, certainly the phenomenon is not far off. Now, detectors. Now, remember these detectors, there's about a hundred of them for what we call an ERB, which stands for equivalent rectangular bandwidth. You can think of it as a bandwidth of bandpass filter, but it's not really a bandpass filter. I'll talk more about that in a little while ago. But anyhow, at low frequencies under 500 Hertz, the leading edge of the waveform itself is detected by the inner hair cells, which are the detectors. That means that below 500 Hertz, you pretty much have full phase lock after it goes through this filter bank. So you can actually get phase detection. And obviously if you can get phase detection, you can get time detection. And then at high frequencies, which is over two, kilo, two kilohertz or so, mostly this happens, they fire at the beginning of the waveform envelope because the nerves can only fire up to about a kilohertz. So you can't really get a waveform lock. So what you get instead is when this energy shows up in that ERB, there will be a lot of firings and then it will settle down to a lesser number of filings as that signal continues. And the firing rate anywhere in frequency is proportional to loudness. And be, let's be specific, I'm referring to the technical term loudness, which means the perceived intensity, not the SPL. Perceived intensity or loudness, there's two or three talks I've done on this already. Um, if you wanna know more about that, you're better off going back and listening to those talks because there's an hour and a half or two hours right there. <laughs> um, but that's basically loudness. Now, and then you wonder what happens between 500 Hertz and two kilohertz. And the answer there is that both of the mechanisms conflict. And you'll find out that if you look at the sensitivity of a person to interaural time delay, it gets, actually gets worse in that range because the two mechanisms are fighting with each other. But that's what one ear can do. So at one ear, you get waveform lock up to about 500, you get envelope lock above two kilohertz, and you get some of this, some of that between those two. When you get close to two kilohertz, it's pretty much all envelope lock. When you get out oh, six or 700, still mostly waveform lock, but it starts to fall apart. So. That's what ear, one ear can do. Now, what is the frequency sensitive, sensitivity? Well, I did a previous talk on all of the, uh, on all of the uh, other talks here on, on um, how do you, oh, sorry. Um, I did the um, thing here is basically how the ear works in more detail on the first bullet. You want to take, you want to read that think about it before you actually try to go and do a deep dive for this talk because everything in there matters. <laughs> okay, and we have about 3,500 inner hair cells, like I said, and each cluster is stimulated primarily from about one ERB or equivalent rectangular bandwidth, but it's not a symmetric filter. Um, an ERB is approximately, um, equal bandwidth, low frequencies, somewhere between 40 and 50 Hertz. And above where the quarter octave starts to get bigger than 40 or 50 Hertz, then it's about a quarter octave. So down in the 40 to 50 Hertz range, it is kind of symmetric, but once you get up above that point, then it's there's a, from the center of the filter to both edges is a different length because it's more logarithmic than it is or exponential, however you want to look at it, it's more of a log frequency response than it is a linear frequency response. And the detectors are roughly uniform along the ERB, unless you have hearing damage. Um, very typically, most humans, especially in the modern world, have the highest frequency ones destroyed before they get basically out of grade school, um, which is sad because the world is really too loud and you really need to take care of your ears, but you can't if you have to ride in a car and a bus or a train or anything like that. It's just some, not something you can practically do. Now the filters, 
Like I said, they're not symmetric. The way the filters work, which is a sort of a traveling wave filter, a filter has more sensitivity to far below the center frequency than it does to far above the center frequency. Right around the, the if you will, in the passband, the sensitivity is more or less equal. But when you get above, high, when you go up in frequency past the passband, the response falls off like a brick. And this is because the energy in the base across the basal membrane it actually passed through the basal membrane and gone back out into the sinus. And the energy has gone, you don't have any response. Now, at low frequencies, since the energy goes farther, farther, farther up the cochlea, you will get some more response to low frequencies, to lower frequencies. Now, if everybody's probably heard the phrase upward spread of masking, and that comes about because lower frequencies will actually cause some stimulation at a higher frequency due to this filter shape. But higher frequencies generally do not affect a lower frequency at all. So that's just something you have to remember. And you remember that again, once you get out of where the filters interact, these effects and the detection can be completely un completely unrelated or completely related depending on the input stimulus. And that time alignment along the cochlea is something we're gonna talk about a lot. So on top of all that, the system is nonlinear. Um, when you have two signals within one filter bandwidth, they will interact with the inner hair cell to fire the outer hair cell. When the outer hair cell fires, that reduces the gain so what happens is that you don't get 10 times the increase in firing of the neurons from uh, 10 times the amplitude, 20 dB, or you don't get, or for, for that matter, for 10 times the energy, which is 10 dB, you get about a fire, fire rating, fire, firing rate increase of about factor two. And remember that signals outside that bandwidth don't affect the bandwidth. So that means if you take two signals that are completely unrelated in terms of the cochlear filter bank, they don't co-compress, whereas the signals inside of a band do co-compress. Now the compression starts about a millisecond after the detection. So there's a little bit of a delay, which is basically the firing of the neuron, the two neurons in the loop, which means that relative to the rest of a signal, the very onset of the signal is emphasized. This is important because it means that effectively the system gain is turned down once some, once some energy enters the air. Now the loudness, like I said here, adds across different ERBs, compresses inside an ERB. Um, the compression level is a matter of some research. Um, but the point thing to remember here is loudness is the perceived intensity. Once we're talking about what goes to the brain, we're talking about loudness. We are not talking about SPL. We are not talking about spectrum. We are not talking about level. We are talking about loudness. The brain works on loudness. Now, the compression basically is necessary because the inner hair, inner hair cells have about a 30 dB dynamic range. And what happens is, is the compression maps 30 dB dynamic range to, oh, people argue whether it's effectively between 70 dB or 100 dB dynamic range. Um, that depends as you, you basically see the compression start to fail when you get over 70 dB, which is roughly also the equivalent of where you consider things too loud. But um, the compression at least gives you some change in intensity between the absolute threshold and somewhere around 100 dB. Above that, it's primarily body sensation. And by the way, you're hurting ears, don't do that. Okay, now as the levels goes up, because of the way the mechanics work, the bandwidth of the filter gets wider. This has a couple of interesting effects. This also affects imaging and spatial perception because as the level goes up, the articulation, the ability to understand and recognize features in the sound gets worse because the filter bandwidth gets wider. 
But on the other hand, the time sensitivity gets somewhat better because the filter bandwidth is wider. So the time sensitivity is actually narrower. Remember time resolution times frequency resolution is greater than or equal to some constant. And what the constant is, is a good discussion in signal processing. But just remember, if you increase the time resolution, you decrease the frequency resolution. If you increase the frequency resolution, you decrease the time resolution. There's no way around it. And remember that the compression starts about a millisecond after the inner hair cell firing. Now it releases more slowly than that. And there is learning expectation and all sorts of other things involved in how fast the compression releases. So that is hard to describe, but if you're expecting a signal to continue for a while, the compression, your, your, higher, your higher order facilities will basically keep the compression on. If you think you're listening for an impulse, the compression will come, get off in maybe 10 to 15 milliseconds. So um, you can't really assign one time constant to that because you can actually consciously as well as subconsciously affect that. So what comes out of the detector? What do you get out of one of these detectors? Now remember there's 3,500 of these spread over all audible frequencies. First thing you get is a firing rate. That's the measure of loudness in that particular ERB or in that particular frequency range. When I say an ERB, there's not, I said there was 35 as you put them end to end, but you can define an ERB around each detector. And that's an important thing is to remember. So there's heavily over, a whole bunch of heavily over, overlapping, uh, how to put this, a bunch of very heavily overlapping uh, filters. And it has a lot of effects in rest, things like pitch perception and stuff like that, but I'm not gonna talk about that right now. JJ, now, there's yeah, a question. I see um, it. What is the physical mechanism that causes the compression? So, Well, what happens is when you fire the outer hair cell, it gets softer and it changes the, and it changes the uh, coefficients the resonant coefficients of the basal and tectorial membranes. Here's, and, here's a question. When you say and, inner and outer uh, hair cells, is the- Okay, inner I'll go back is, there. Okay, yeah. inner hair cells are detectors. Outer hair cells implement the compression. And they do that by changing a sperm constant between two membranes in a year. Basically, as they get softer and softer, they detune the mechanism so that it has lower gain. And that's the physical mechanism. Um, do I need more detail right now, John? Okay. Uh, we can no, talk about you. that. Okay, we can talk about more later. That That's a three hour talk by itself. Thanks, <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to stick to the... Uh, and it's um, just in case it's not actually a reflex, there is a very tight there's a very tight loop right on the basal membrane that gives you the primary compression. And the release of the compression seems to be affected by signals that come back from the brain. Um, you're also, somebody was asking about, is there an indication there's conscious control? There's certainly a flinch reflex. I'm not sure if you can talk about, uh, if you can describe the uh, flinch reflex in a short amount of time, but if there's a big flash, in front of you, you'll actually automatically depolarize a bunch of your outer hair cells. I think it's probably due to lightning or something like that. And once you learn how to play with this, you can actually do some of this to yourself. Um, person is asking about different tones. This hey, is Jim, a let me this is a completely a different problem. You go ahead, if you, Steve. If you, if you get a question in, please read it off of the chat because not everyone's oh. following along at home. Okay. So. I'm not gonna handle the difference tone that gets into a much more complicated thing inside the head at a level that I'm not gonna to address tonight. So I'm sorry, I'm not gonna talk about that tonight. Um, I had a question here, can you talk about difference tones when you have two different tones in the two ears? Um, basically it comes about because of the phase detection and the leading edges, but um, that's getting into higher that's getting into higher order processing that I was going to talk about tonight. 
So then you, have it, you get the firing rate, you get the start of the signal. Low frequencies, you have waveform lock. At a kilohertz, you're pushing the waveform lock, actually. You find that those difference tones will probably work better at lower frequencies. Uh, for high frequencies, you get the leading edge of the envelope. And for mid frequencies, like I said, the two mechanisms conflict, conflict a bit. So we have two errors. Well, what happens? We can compare the time relationships between the two errors as far as you can compare what actually comes out of the loudness capture, which is to say the waveform under 500 hertz, a mix between 502 kilohertz and leading edge above two kilohertz. And this will give you interaural time difference. And you will definitely, you, this is definitely a primary cue. The leading edges in an ERV get emphasized because of the compression mechanism. And this is one of the things that causes Haas effect. There's also, there's clearly both low level peripheral effects and high level effects um, that cause the Haas effect, but the low level effect is from the compression. And this is actually a very important thing as far as detecting localization. AJ, um, can you describe the, what is the, define Haas effect, please? The Haas effect is that when you have two signals in the same air that come within a certain amount of distance, they merge. And for you to hear the second signal, you have to turn the gain up a lot. And what's happening there is partly that when the compression starts, it basically wipes out the gain in the system and you don't actually even much detect that second signal. Basically, if you have two spikes, a couple of milliseconds apart, the second one pretty much gets eaten by the first one unless the second one's like 10 or 15 dB higher. Is this something that uh, perceptual coding uses? Uh, not too often because uh, you don't, that requires a half an hour into time resolution in MDCTs. And that's, <laughs> that's a different problem. No worries, thank you. Okay, the leading edges, and ERB will be relative, but emphasize them. Really, I keep leaning on this leading edge thing for a reason, which you'll find out later. And of course, the interaural level difference will get to the brain by the interaural loudness difference. So now that's what you get out of two ears. But what gets, now we have to talk about what gets into the ears. And so we have to talk about the acoustics of the head. Now the acoustics, the head in a room come from a variety of sources. The direct signal is always first if there's a direct signal. If you don't have occlusion, there's not an object between you and the source, it always gets there first. You have direct, you have reflections of the direct signal. And something to remember the reflections of the direct signal is most sound sources like, you know, musical instruments, percussion, um, voices, dropping a glass in the floor. You have to remember the sound sources are usually directional as well. So what gets to you from the direct may actually have a substantially different spectrum than what's bouncing off the wall and getting to you. This is one of those things that makes miking an instrument very difficult. You have to get the kind of sound you want from the instrument. And you have to remember that instruments are pretty much usually directional. And then there's the reverberant signal for rooms that have any substantial reverberation. And there is an argument about what constitutes reverberation among acousticians, whether is it whether the the reverberation adds its power, which is to say it's incoherent, or whether it adds its amplitude, which is to say it's coherent. And there's a whole lot of discussion here, which I'm going to short circuit. I'm going to say when I say reverberant, I mean perceptually reverberant, which is rather different than actually acoustically reverberant. <laughs> it's unfortunate, but that's how psychoacoustics usually seems to work. So um, when you have the, if you have a true really reverberant, acoustic reverberant signal, the reverberant signals will basically be uncorrelated to the two ears. So people have said one of the ways to do reverberation is uncorrelated, make uncorrelated signals. The problem is, is there is literally an infinite number of ways to do decorrelation. Some of them sound like reverberation. Some of them are just 
weird. I mean, you can put in a Hilbert, Hil you can do a Hilbert transform to something and it sounds nothing like what you expect. <laughs> but the use of the analytic measure cross correlation is not the right metric. So I'm just gonna leave that out for now. I'm gonna say that I'm talking about signals that sound reverberant. We and that will Go ahead. Uh, can you please say a few words about low frequency signal correlation and external localization? Um, that will come later. Okay, great, thank you. A more point, the, that's a question talking about externalization, actually not localization. Lo localization, when you have the leading edge, the leading edge gives you the ITD and that just will lock a position in the cone of confusion immediately. But we'll get to that later. Now, the path to the ear canal. You know, the path for the direct signal that comes into your head from some direction, it refracts, diffracts, and does uh, around the head, the head just affects the impulse response. It which involves the time delay and the frequency response. And we call this an HRTF or an HRIR. That's head-related transfer function, head-related impulse response. These are exactly the same information in two different forms. But um, some people talk about HRIR, some people talk about HRTF. The way you actually use it may be the other form from what you measured. It doesn't matter, they're exactly the same information as soon as you actually, soon as you actually have the transfer function and not just the magnitude response for the frequency domain. Now, the path to your canal for the direct signal is one thing. Then you have reflections coming from different paths because they're not coming directly from, unless it's directly behind the, the direct sound, which is really not, very much an ideal situation for articulation, reflections will come from different paths. So they'll have different transfer functions or, or impulse responses. And then reverberation comes typically from all around you. A good concert hall will have a sense of reverberation first from the front and then from the back. Um, <clears throat> so there'll basically be a couple of different um, Head, resp head responses involved. And I'll talk about diffuse HRTFs in a minute because that's basically what you get when you put signals from all directions. Um, you also can define a transfer, a transfer function for that. And that's actually an important consideration later. So definitions here. I'm put in a whole bunch of definitions. You, you'll see these over and over. There's the interaural time delay. That's a function of direction and distance, not just direction. It's a function of distance and frequency denoted by frequency, radius, theta, which is the angle zero to 360 in the plane, in the uh, horizontal plane, and phi, which is the elevation plus or minus 90. So basically, it's um, what you would think of as polar coordinates. And thing to remember, it's polar coordinates as a function of frequency. You also have to include frequency in there. Because interaural time delay is not necessarily the same across frequency, which is actually somewhat of a quite, as turns out to be quite useful clue in some cases. You have the interaural level difference, which is a fun function of the same things and which is how much more or less energy you have at a given frequency coming from a given time, direction and distance. F is frequency, obviously. Radius is the distance from the source to the midline between the ears. That's just a convenient reference. Theta is the horizontal angle. Yes, we got this. And cone of confusion, a term I used a minute ago, is a roughly cone-shaped thing which goes around in a cone based on an ITD. It's roughly a cone-shaped surface, but not exactly, but it's a surface over which the mean ITD does not change. And I have to say the mean ITD because ITD is, of course, a function of frequency. So direct sound, is that what comes out of the source? Well, there's two ways to turn, use the term direct. One is in terms of acoustics, which means the sound that comes directly from the source 
to you. The other one is a sound which you can get, which you can localize an accurate direction for, which is a perceptually direct source. So is it just what comes out of the source? Well, no. Sources are usually directional. Usually there will be a direction to the source, but there's all sorts of things going to happen. Even if you're not too far away, airflow in a room, air currents, eddies in the air, wind, actually affect the direct sound. Even if you just have one single direct radiator 100 feet away, <laughs> there is going to be an effect from the air transmission as well as from the HRTFs. Um, because if you think about the transmission of air, if you have a continuous flow of air in a direction, it actually carries the sound with it. If the direction, if it's coming from the source to you, it actually reduces the effective distance a little bit. If it's going from you to the source, it makes it source effectively a little bit farther away. If it's turbulent, it means you have a little bit of jitter and it's really hard to characterize, but you have a little bit of change in the delay of the entire signal as the, 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 air, the sound goes through the path of this turbulent air between you and the far end. And this by itself tends to cause some decorrelation just from the transmission of air. And then you have to remember that air is nonlinear. Anything that is really has high intensity like percussion or brass will have spectral changes as you get away from the source. If you have something that hits over 140 dB, the ear is, the ear is profoundly nonlinear. As you back away from it, the spectrum is going to change just because of the nonlinear, nonlinear nature of it. You're going to see the spectrum change because there's a level drops, the inter the intermod basically starts to go away. So what happens is typically you actually have more high frequencies as you back away. And this is one of the many things that makes miking things like percussion really hard, is because you literally don't have the same you know spectrum at a foot that you have at a hundred feet. And which one did you want? Good luck with that. So this direct to sound diffusion thing. Yes, there's diffusion on the direct sound. Not a lot, but it affects sensation rather quite a bit because you'll find out if you're in a still room and like one of our listening rooms here, if you're one of our listening rooms with the AC off, sitting in the middle between the speakers and you play a central image, it winds up right in the middle of your head. That's because our systems are very, very carefully aligned. And when there's no air movement, you don't have any of this diffusion. And now you don't externalize the signal. You don't have any cues that are external to your head. It sounds like you're wearing headphones. It's a real pain in the neck to mathematically model this. Um, more won't be said here because it goes right past the mathematics I know in terms of transmission modeling. And unfortunately, it's past pretty much the uh, state-of-the-art in transmission modeling too. So it goes way beyond me. But this is one of these things that has something to do with decorrelation. Again, you hear people talking about decorrelating signals. But again, there's an infinite number of ways to talk about to do decorrelation. Most of them sound profoundly wrong. Some of them sound like you've just entered into a uh, entered into like, am I in a spaceship or something? So you cannot just go for decorrelation. You have to do decorrelation that somehow or other models the actual effect that you're having. And I just noticed a comment here from John Hudson. Yes, talking across a campfire is a very good example of this kind of decorrelation or diffusion. So what happens to the direct sound? Well, once it gets to your head, well, it's affected by the appropriate head-related function and it gets into the ear canal. Now this gives you an ITD, interval time delay, and that creates, that very quickly places 
the location on the cone of confusion, which is to say um, the cone of things which have the constant ITD. This is something the auditory system is and the, and the brain are very good at detecting. Now, the interesting thing is that the change of ITD over frequency can very much help disam disambiguate the elevation and the level difference as well. So you can use the combination of interaural level difference, interaural time difference, and the variation in both level difference and time difference. That's where you get your primarily your primary distance sense, your primary directional sensation. And you remember that the direct sound always gets there first. Now that's important because you will localize on that first signal. There have been fun experiments done where the where a person has been mic'd and there's another loudspeaker that's closer so that it pulls your image into the close loudspeaker and then you can trick the auditory system by just slowly turning down the loudspeaker and the image will stay suddenly in the direction stubbornly in the direction of the loudspeaker until it's almost gone at which point it will finally yank back to the original source so there's all sorts of very high level processing goes on and I will not specify, will not even begin to speculate exactly how that goes about in the brain. But that ITD and the internal level difference is the primary set of cues. And the auditory compression of course means that the stuff that gets there after the direct is discounted. This helps emphasize the direct sound. Now, when you're in reverberant information, there's something referred to as the critical distance, which is the distance at which the reverberant energy matches the direct energy. You can easily hear through something where you're at the critical distance and localize just fine. And the reason is because the leading edges will be above that reverberant energy quite substantially until you get well out of well beyond the critical distance and you'll still be able to localize because you detect those leading edges. This means you can hear through reverberation. If you're in a room and you're trying to listen to somebody and you're watching them at the same time, you can tell when they're talking and you learn to actually merge your sight. Well, you, don't, you do naturally, you do it naturally. You'll match the energy your ears getting with the energy when you know the other person is actually making sound. So you can heal, hear through noise, you can understand through noise. And then you're aided and embedded with this by the fact that stuff that has a more or less constant envelope that is not correlated in the two ears, your brain is really good at just throwing away. I mean, if you concentrate, you will hear that noise. But if you're trying to hear through it, you will not hear that noise. We had a very, creepy thing happened to us many years ago at at and when you're just starting to demonstrate the pack encoder. And we were playing a stereo thing of a track um, that had a fuzz guitar, very pitchy signal, which is to say, it looks like a string of impulses. So it has leading edges all the way from the fundamental all the way up to 20 kilohertz. And we played it. We played it in stereo. It sounded like all the frequencies above nine or 10 kilohertz just vanished. And that something is wrong, what's going on? We turn it to the left channel, it all comes back. We turn it to the right channel, it's okay. Turn it to the middle, they seem to be gone again. They weren't gone, of course, you can't, can't get that kind of capture in a cancellation in a, especially a lousy listening room, which is where we were listening. But what was happening is the coding we were doing, um, the coding we were doing in that thing was basically smoothing out the envelope above about 10 kilohertz. So what happens is, is there's no envelope to lock into above 10 kilohertz and your brain was just throwing it away. And once you learn that, you listen, and now you can hear the high frequencies zinging around the room. It's really actually quite an unpleasant sensation. And turning up the signal to noise ratio of those higher frequencies by like half a dB, wham, it just all came back. So your ear 
your brain is really good at throwing away things that are not parts of what you're, uh, that are not parts of what it thinks you're listening for. It will just throw it away. And another point here, somebody pointed out, um, I'll thank one of the guys I worked with, says, point out what happens if you have a flat envelope at high frequencies, directional sensation just goes down the tubes. So why is it hard to localize a high frequency tone? It's a tone, it has a flat envelope. It's a high frequency, it bounces off of everything. Um, is, there's no first arrival, there's no first arrival, there's no real inter level difference and the reflections interfere and you move around. So it's really almost impossible to localize a continuous high frequency tone, that's why. Which brought up the point that smoke alarms should go beep, 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 beep. Because that way, all those beeps will actually give you an envelope to lock into. One beep only gives you one leading edge and you're just out of luck. That's just one of those frustrations we all share. Um, from the person asked about the RIAA curve, having something to do with 500 or two kilohertz, I don't believe they're related. I believe that they're more related to the actual mechanisms of putting down an LP. So I don't think this is actually something that comes, is, I think it's a mechanical issue. Okay, now, reflected sound. Timber from different directions for an instrument is almost always different. If you think about a helicopter when it flies over, how the pitch changes. Um, and I'm not talking about the Doppler, I'm talking about the, the sound, the timber of the, uh, of the sound. Or if you walk around a trumpet player. Um, so you may have different parts of the signal coming from different directions. And the reflections sometimes can enhance localization, sometimes destroy it. In general, strong early reflections will, inf will, in re will enforce the uh, loudness of the instrument and somewhat control the timbre of the instrument, instrument, but will not really help to localize it. Um, and when I say this, we're talking up um, path of a few meters I mean, at one, basically you can think sound going about one foot per millisecond, you know, up to maybe 20 milliseconds, you can consider early, that's the bitter end of early. But um, these kinds of things are what you get in almost every kind of acoustic domain. And they are actually a cue that we're used to and we understand. They can work against us sometimes but um, I'll let the recording engineers talk about that if they like. Um, and, but all those reflections are coming from different directions. So they're all going through slightly different HRTFs. And curiously enough, we seem to be really good at dealing with that. Probably it's learning because that's the kind of acoustic we're always in. Uh, and this is not talking about the reflections and two channel rendering thing, which are something that's added when you do um, headphone virtualization. Um, reflections can and can help the phantom image in a stereo system, can break, the, break up the phantom image. It will affect the timbre, but the part about two channel rendering in speakers or in headphones we're not talking about today. We're talking now about the actual reflections that reach your head from a room. Because there's another entire other set of effects there. Now diffuse reflections, what does diffuse mean? First, well, it means that the leading edge across frequency is scrambled. Basically, you can think of it as the time delay varies uh, with frequency. This is one of the th places where the low frequency um, diffusion is actually important because that actually is one of the things that creates a distance sensation. Diffuse reflections will add to the loudness and can create a sense of distance, but usually not mess up the timbre too much. 
But on the other hand, of course, you, you can have too much of anything. But HRTF, if I do the diffuse reflections, helps if you're trying to do something that's like a um, speaker virtualization. Um, that gets into about four hours worth of work. Late specular reflections, please don't. I mean, they're just, they create new leading edges. They leading edges after the release of part of the compression um, can totally wreck articulation. They exist, but basically they work counter to the uh, whole problem of um, how to capture direction and how to capture the spectrum of safe speech. So they just mess things up. They're generally bad news. Can you, can you give an example of a late specular reflection just so we understand that more? Well, it's something like, I can uh, give you an example of a really bad one. I, there was a theater in New Jersey that had basically para parabolic walls on either side of the proscenium. And they were covered in curtains. The fire marshal made, made them take the curtains down. And we found out that there was about 220 milliseconds of delay from both sides to the center of row eight. You couldn't understand a thing. Anybody walked um, all the way down, all the way downstage in the middle and started to talk, you couldn't understand a thing they said. That's an extreme example, but in general, you know, you know, uh, if you think about it, if you delay a signal by 100 milliseconds and talk into it, it gets really hard to understand because now you're approaching the syllable rate. Okay, cool. I mean, it's, if you've heard it, you'd know it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Thank you. And you can try it. Just try setting something for a 50 or 60 millisecond delay and run some speech through it and listen to it. And odds on, unless you're trying to make it sound very strange, you're likely to yank that and yank that effect right back out. But it really does, especially if the delay to the ears is different, it will just completely muck up articulation. Um, also muck up the instrumental articulation. Okay, so reverberation. I'm talking here about the stored energy in the room all of it, pretty much, that isn't for early reflections. I'm talking about the incoherently added part, the, that's the acoustic reverberation term, but also of the reflections that happen rapidly in close succession, but can actually be measured as specific reflections instead of as overall envelope. There is really an endless argument, acousticians and such, that a lot of that isn't reverberation, but ear treats it like reverberation. Um, I mention this because if you start reading the literature, you're going to find things that look completely contradictory because people are talking about two completely different things. Um, there's end, basically there's endless arguments. So when does late reflections end? When does high time density of reflections become true reverberation? And the argument is there's a point um, and a point in frequency and in time where things appear to be incoherent. But there's two problems with that. The first one is if you increase your time, that you measure the coherence in, you'll find out that the frequency changes. Um, you find out the uh, frequency changes, the uh, what where, where that, where that effect starts changes, and you'll find out that the length gets longer, that the coherent stuff gets longer and longer. Now, eventually it does become incoherent, but that's because of the diffusion I was talking about. And that diffusion is a very gentle process. So it has to be quite a long time before you actually get the mathematically diffuse. Your ear will think it's reverberation long before then. And the timbre of direct versus reflect reverberated sound. This is actually an important thing. If you can, because of the time domain of the signal, you can hear the difference between the direct timbre and the reverberant timbre. This helps you also disambiguate 
along the cone of confusion. Because if something is behind you, behind the Pinashata, that means that the you have a lot less high frequencies from the direct. The reverberation, which comes from all around, doesn't have the high frequency loss. So what happens is that you can tell if it's in front, you expect the direct to be brighter than the reverberation. If it's from behind you, you expect the reverberation to be brighter than the direct signal. This actually works. You've noticed somebody has a cold, clogged nose, a lot of high frequencies missing in their voice. They say hello from in front of you and you look behind in front of you, you look behind you. That's actually because your expectation is tricking you there. Now, there's a lot of other things that happen with the perception of the direct versus the reverberant spectrum. Um, I could probably go on for three hours. I won't. HRTFs. Why am I not giving a set of HRTFs? Well, you can go out on the web and find a bunch. They're not one size fits all. Dealing with distance is quite tricky. But I will describe the basic trends. HRIR is the same deal. You know, you can turn one into the other with a transform. So horizontal trends. Well, high frequencies are peaked when the source is pointed straight into the ear canal. That means you hear the high, more high frequencies when it's to the right or the left than it is when it's in the front. Now, at other at angles where you have substantial contribution from two paths around the head, uh, which is to say any place where um, it's, hard, it's hard to define exactly where, but what you'll see when you have two passes around the head, they're two different directions. So you'll get either one zero or two zeros in the spectrum. So you see nulls moving as you move an angle. The far side HRTF, because it's blocked by the head, is the energy is much, much smaller above base. And if you get close to the head, then the energy even at base will be substantially smaller. So as elevation depends on the other shoulder distance, you have a reflection between your shoulder and your ear. That is prim a primary source of elevation. Um, it's interesting to see how well people can uh, actually uh, can actually learn how to do somebody else's elevation given a cue, but that is something that is quite personal. And depression of source involves body shadowing. And is also even more so subject to expectation because we usually don't expect sounds coming from under our feet. So now, very diffuse reverberated signals. What is the spectrum of that? Well, what do you use for an HRTF? First off, you know that it's going to be very, the envelope is going to be very dissimilar for the left ear and right ear. The arrival time inside of one ERB will be scrambled at each ear and scrambled differently at the two ears. That will make something perceptually diffuse. This scrambling is very important to hearing things more as reverberant instead of some kind of ghastly echo. And then the same time delay across several channels over many ERBs, this is across two channels. If you put something to the headphones and you have the time delay scrambled in one channel, but you have exactly the same scrambling in both channels, that is gonna localize the so-called reverberation under the signal. And this is why, I think it's obvious to everybody, this is why you have to have independent reverbs for left and right in stereo. And this is why if you're doing more multi-channel, you have to have more independent reverbs. And now we get to distance. So even with lots of reverberation, we can detect direction well, but um, at some point it breaks down, you can use only interval level difference. But basically, the farther away you get, the reverberation in a room tends to be more or less constant in level 
depending on position, assuming it's really a fairly reflective room. That means if you're close to the source, there's the signal level is higher than the reverb. If you back away, what happens is the direct signal decreases and decreases and decreases, but the reverberation doesn't decrease so much. So that gives you a, dis, a, a strong sense of distance. But if you're in different rooms, the, dis, the distance sensation will change. If you have a long T60 and a long first reflection time, and a long first reflection time, you can back off a lot farther before things sound far away. So direct to reverberant ratio is a distance cue. There's another distance cue. Remember I was talking about air currents and so on? The farther away you back away, the farther away it is. It is a really tricky thing to get right. Um, and it's also an important part of headphone externalization. Um, I can't talk about all of this right now, so I won't. But um, again, this whole idea of throwing in decorrelators, you have to do the right thing, not just decorrelate it. And the more decorrelation, of course, you get, we should say the more you break up the leading edge, the farther away something gets. That is if you do it right. Now, what do you do for virtualization? You add in the sources, you put in the HRTFs, you add some census space via reverb. The reverb has to be diffuse. It's important to have separate diffusion and you have to have some amount of diffusion to externalize. But more, more about that, I can't say. It's complicated, tricky, and not available, not available to talk about. So, congratulations, I'm almost done. Basically, first thing you have to recognize is the acoustics and transmission path. You have to customize to some extent the HRTFs, HRIRs. It seems like more or less head size pretty much suffices to get it right because people are pretty good at adapting. I think partly the reason they're good at adapting is because you know if you move your hair, you change the HRTF, but you don't have any trouble with that. Emphasis on first arrival above 2K, phase lock below 500 hertz. Some of both in the mid frequencies. So that's basically the effect that the ear gives you to uh, hear. And now, there we go. Questions? Well, thank you. So what I'd recommend here, and others can join in, is uh, people could probably just uh, open up their videos and uh, at some point we're gonna go around the room, but I think it's, it would be fine to have uh, anyone that has a direct question to just come on up and uh, ask it. Yes, that would be fine. Cool. And here we are. And I believe you'll have to unmute people somewhere. Uh, if they can unmute themselves, I believe. And I don't uh, know. we can uh, turn off your screen share of, of the, the big white thing. Okay, I can do that. And then we'll have everybody in there. My video is still muted. But... Who, uh, who was that? Rod Evanson. You, okay, did you... I think I turned him off. Yeah, that was the problem. So thank you. Uh, right, right there, and uh, uh, there you can go. And I just draw, I just dropped my second screen out because it will be easier to talk that way. Yeah. Cool. There were probably a few people that I turned off, so if uh, we should have a, a solution for that, maybe some of the hosts can can do that if you're looking for it. That's the reason why you want people to mute themselves, mute their video themselves rather than us doing it because it's a hassle to turn it back on. So just okay. go ahead and ask questions, people. I've got a question. Have... Uh, nobody else has jumped in yet. So JJ, you mentioned uh, uh, he headphone externalization a couple of times. 
uh, I guess, can you describe uh, sort of what the state of the art is in terms of getting good and potent externalization for 3D sound and when that might be available in the mainstream? I can't comment right now. Sorry. Okay. JJ, I had a question about the Haas effect that you were referring to earlier and also yeah. your, your definitions of reverberance. Yeah. And I'm curious if um, when looking a little bit at the reviewing the Haas, Haas effect, if timing is, is a part of whether or not something is reverberant. And I, I guess what I'm saying is, it, does something have to be outside of the 40 millisecond time delay of what we kind of define with the Haas effect in order to be reverberant as you describe it? To some extent, because inside the inside the, the where the Haas effect is having substantial space, you're actually not hearing the details. But I would I would have to say that certainly acoustic reverberation has to be outside of that. And I am suspecting I haven't really thought about this, but I suspect that uh, that um, perceptual reverberation ditto. Um, that's actually an interesting question. I don't know the answer to completely off the top of my head. JJ, are the, uh, the, the, the frequencies uh, as we age, our, our hearing changes, can you care to address how, how that affects? Uh, well, what it affects, what it affects is as you lose sensation, you have trouble Basically, the loudness growth is in that frequency range is affected. And that means that if you can't detect the stuff, you don't have the loudness sensation and you lose the ability to get uh, disambiguation. I mean, it's not simple. It's not hard. Hold on a second. I got to pull a plug. Um, it's not basically most put it as unless you have noise loss, which is say in the ear canal range, the if you don't have that, basically what you lose is you lose the ability to use the to use the cues in the part of the frequencies you can't hear anymore. But um, when you get the problem with the speech range, um, it's pretty much the same, except it's even worse because if you think about it, if you don't have a sensation, you can't detect the leading edge. And the leading edge will then come out of dark, as it were, instead out of some level of loudness. And that has actually an effect, a strong effect on a startle reflex. Because, you, I mean, this is trouble. If you look at people who don't like noise, many of them have some hearing damage. And the reason that it bothers them is because a constant low level of noise is something you automatically just disregard. But if you have a uh, if you have a uh, something rising out of dark, you know to, that's something that you know that's one of the things that the ear does is gives you that early warning system, and coming out of dark will start or startle somebody and catch their attention. Whereas low, you know, ripple and noise level doesn't, but going does. So you know it affects a bunch of things. I think it affects localization less than it affects a lot of other things, unless you have highly unequal loss, of course. If you have unequal loss, you're missing information. You can still sort of localize with one ear by turning your head and hearing the HRTF. So that does work, but it's not nearly as good as binaural. Thank you. David Tang has a question. You want to just uh, ask it straight out? If you the unmute. There you oh, go. I was just looking at a new product that was just released uh, by Waves uh, plugin that you apply on the master uh, master bus, and uh, it allows you to use headphones and emulates the listening environment at the uh, Ocean Way Nashville, uh, the mix environment there. And you can dial in various levels of, uh, uh, you know, room ambience and so forth. 
but I, I was just curious about if you had a chance to look at that or if anybody don't, else wanted to chime in on that particular I, product. I don't generally comment on products. You can probably understand why. <laughs> Sorry. Question, JJ? Sure. Um, you mentioned very briefly about stereo reverb, and it, it goes to something I've been thinking about a lot for a long time, that if we had stereo communications that captured the, the left and right re reverb of the room differently, do you think that would be sufficient to trigger the, the brain rejecting the reverb, or do you think it would have to be a full binaural capture, individualized binaural for that to work? I would have to run that experiment. <laughs> I know I could do it artificially. Um, I not entirely, I think it would depend a lot on the actual acoustic you're recording in. Yeah, I mean, everybody's experienced recording the, you know, the classroom teacher with your mono recorder and then you go home and listen to your notes and you're like, I can't hear what's singing, but it sounded fine in the room. I'm just wondering yeah. how far we could go to solving that problem, especially in these COVID times of we all have to listen to each other through the same portholes. <laughs> well, stereo would almost always work somewhat better. How much better is hard to say. You know, binaural would work, of course. That that would work if it's done right with uh, something actually in the ear canal. But yeah, I, I just triggered it when you mentioned that binaural reverbs, because I'm not a recording engineer that uh, I wasn't familiar with that, that you said, yeah, anybody that does binaural reverb in stereo has had to deal with this, um, that stereo reverb can't be the same reverb. <laughs> Like, oh, yeah, that's and different. well, that's exactly what's killing you in the mono recording of speech. Yes. Right. Yeah, it's um, mono reverb, and that's bad. What it take? What it takes to get the imaging to work out right is an interesting question, but stereo would certainly work better than mono. That I'm sure of. Unless you did it wrong, you can always. I shouldn't say it. You can always do it wrong. <laughs> I I had a. Uh, a little comment uh, when I'm uh, doing recording work on location with nothing more than a pair of microphones and I'm looking for the reverberation in the room. Uh, I'm usually going from the sound source during a rehearsal and backing up to a point where I'm getting an equal amount of both. That usually seems to work for uh, a pair of directional microphones, but once I go to something like an Omni, I'm usually having to move in closer. So, yeah. uh, well, that's a classic problem. One of the problem, one of the that, that's a classic problem because stereo really doesn't capture enough information to give you the full effect. I mean, I've had this. I you know I've done some record. We've done some recording with this five channel mic array. I don't know. I talked about it late '90s, I think, in the AES. Um, and what we found out is with the five channel array reproduced in five speakers, you are good where it sounded good to your ears. But when you get to two channels, you have to get way up closer. The reason is because with the five channels, the interference in the room for the five speakers is breaking up that reverberation and breaking up the ambience so that it doesn't come from the front. It doesn't cover everything. But when you have two channels, you just don't have enough to break it up. And the other thing we found out when we did that, which was interesting, is that the change in bass in those five mics, you know, even though you think you don't get any difference, you know, in a thing basically the twice the size of your head in terms of, you don't think the bass is going to be very different. You'll be surprised in a good room just how much change in the onset of the bass is at the same frequency in those different mics. And what we find is we can have a case where we have, with the five mics running, we have the same spectrum as the two mics and we checked it, you know, we check all this stuff, but with the five mics running, it sounds like there's a room behind you with two mics. It sounds boomier than, you know what I mean by, <laughs> it just doesn't sound good at all. But the thing is, it's the same spectrum. The only thing that's changing is the structure of the bass in the playback room. 
one of the things I have noticed, though, the more microphones I set out, the more low end seems to come up, especially in terms of uh, background noise uh, in the low frequencies. But well, you can get into a lot of trouble with uh, venues too. I mean, one of the other problems we had with that array is it captured venues very nicely. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's not. Sometimes, in fact, it's kind of disturbing. Thank you. So, I have a I have a question for you about the uh, right thing when it comes to uh, decorrelation. How many hours you got? Well, no, the, that. <coughs> The question is, we, I understand that uh, exactly that, sure, uh, there's one way to correlate, but there's a lot of ways to decorrelate. But when you say that is, my question is really, do we get that place marker because we don't have time for it? Or do we get that place marker because that's a paper somebody really is going to get a lot of praise for writing to characterize what is the correct right thing that we're looking for. You, you know what I mean? Well, I do. You're going to sort of hate my answer, but the answer is I work for a company that wants to make a profit. Yes, okay. <laughs> so, well, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I understand that that answers my It is question. also intensely complicated and hideously controversial, I will add. Yes. But, um, I mean, I've been through a lot of attempts at doing reverberation and decorrelation and stuff, and the mathematics is difficult. It really is. Um, you know, you, you find yourself in a situation where you'd like something to be roughly all pass, but of course all pass is infinite. You know, you can't have a finite time all pass response. And as soon as you hit that conflict, just all sorts of things happen. <laughs> I mean, seriously, there's something I could talk about, but it would, I mean, it literally would require a blackboard and hours. <laughs> it's, yeah, simple as not. Okay, no, no, that was just my question is if it's, if it's uh, largely an open question or if it's, if it's uh, j just too big. My suspicion is, that there are a number of solutions out there which have a good understanding, but nobody's able to talk about them. Okay. This is when I miss working for a large research lab. Because I actually like to give you the answer. <laughs> Sorry. It's all good. Thanks. So JJ, is there any uh, any correlation between work of nor normal hearing and processing and 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 uh, you know cochlear implants and stuff for hearing impaired? Children? Well, cochlear implants don't. Well, cochlear implants typically have now about twenty five bands instead of thirty five hundred bands. You can think of it that way. Um, there is work that's related. But one, I don't work in the medical field. And two, the work in cochlear implants is learning how to optimize a very limited number of cues to do a lot of useful stuff. And it does remarkably well. But uh, things like, I don't think you're going to get the, co the, like, the cocktail party effect, I don't think you're going to get yet. It's, the difficulty is actually physical. You have to get the implant to the point as close as you can to the inner hair cells. And so they will excite a variety of inner hair cells, which is rather wide. So the first thing they've had to do is actually deconvolve the spread of the electrical field inside the cochlea, inside the paralymph that has not necessarily the same characteristics as everyone. <laughs> Sorry, it, it, this all gives me a headache. I have ideas on how the mathematics works, but the ba other than the basic understanding of the frequency resolution, it's really not 
I don't think I don't think there's a lot of intersection yet. I mean, uh, beyond the basics of you know, you have the cochlear filters. You need to imitate the cochlear filters. You have to do the compression externally because the electrical stimulus, you know, the the mechanism that does compression in the cochlea is dead. It's it's a hard problem, and the fact that it works is good. Okay, thanks. All right, well, if there aren't any other questions, um, I've been told that maybe we can move on to the meet, meet and greet portion. Any other last questions for JJ before we uh, give him a round of hearty applause. round of applause? <laughs> Don't worry about it. Thank you, JJ. Yeah, I always love listening to JJ talk because it's so th uh, thought provoking. And um, I've always admired that that JJ is really interested in experience and the exp experiential part of audio. I appreciate that, JJ. Um, I'd like to ask Steve to help Steve us, to help us um, uh, call out names and stuff like that. Okay, and I turned off a couple people's videos. Uh, so if you're having a problem getting your video on, let me know and we'll, we'll do that. So I'm going <clears> to <throat> start going around in my order. Sometimes they change orders. So if I already hit you or I miss you, let me know. Feel free to throw your videos on, at least for your introduction, unless you'd rather not, which is uh, acceptable as well. So Gary, oh, I can start with myself actually. I'm a circuit board designer and a mastering engineer and wrote a couple of books. And I've been involved with the Pacific Northwest section for a long time. And it's, it's a great joy. So Gary Louie. Hi, I am the uh, secretary of the Pacific Northwest section. We're based around Seattle, Washington, USA. I'm uh, Let's see, I'm on the Tellers Committee for the uh, AES, and uh, I'm a LIFE AES member. Sweet. Amy Denio, please. Well, I'm a homespun recording engineer um, and composer, and I'm fascinated by sound, so I'm really glad to be here. This is the first time I've been to an AES anything, so thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And we play you. a lot of music together. I, yeah, and yeah, and I have to like, get to play with Steve. <laughs> Russ. Um, yeah, I'm a. Uh, whoops, in, oh. was, that, was that a Rod or a Ross? Um, I'm a Rod. I, I see Ross there. Go, okay, go ahead, so Ross. Ross Peniman, please. Hi, uh, yes, I'm Ross Peniman. I'm a DSP engineer with Sure. Uh, I also have a keen interest in spatial audio. Uh, I've heard one or two of JJ's talks before and always enjoyed them. So glad to join you. Uh, today. Uh, I'm also the secretary of the Chicago section of the AES. Excellent. Welcome. Michael Goodrow. Hi, I'm Michael Goodrow, retired electrical engineer. Uh, I worked in uh, uh, acoustical uh, for the Navy for Honeywell and uh, got a little studio in the basement and just love, uh, love the thoughts that go around amongst everybody here and I appreciate tonight's lecture. So thank you. Thank you. David Tang. Uh, David Tang, I'm uh, from Vancouver, Washington, uh, right across the river from Portland, Oregon, and um, uh, recently retired from being a recording arts and music production educator. Nice. John Hudson. Hi, I'm an electrical engineer. I uh, work, made a lot of video equipment, used to work for this small company called Ampex long ago when they existed. Now I make uh, uh, specialized receivers for Air Force satellites. Uh, you may have one in your pocket for all we know. And uh, of note, I am the first graduate of the James D. Johnston School of Theatrical Audio Reinforcement. That's something. Boy, thank you. Scott McLaren. Hello. Um, well, pretty much uh, I just listen to music as a hobby. I belong to the Pacific Northwest Audio Society and just like learning more about, about audio. And I received the uh, invite to this. And I figured, what the heck, I'll try it out and hear what you have to say. And wow, um, 
not going to pretend like I understood the majority of it, but I did pick up on some very interesting. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for attending. Uh, Bob Cavanaugh. And your mute. Ah, there we are. I'm on yeah. now. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I, I had a, a kind of a half of a career in the audio business and half a career as a civil engineer. Uh, audio ended pretty much professionally in 1990 when I ended with Studer, as Studer began to devolve from what we knew to be Studer in the old days. And uh, since then, I've been living up here in Bellevue in the Pacific Northwest and uh, retired from a traffic engineering career. I was the guy in the management. I was the guy that was the project manager that put the traffic management center together, you know? Uh, so now I watch a lot of movies and listen to it and surround and it, you know, I, I still manage to put together a reasonably good sounding system and use bookshelves for reverb control. Cool, thank you. <laughs> Very How <laughs> very unsophisticated and i want to thank jj for knowing way more than than he can even talk about cool howard hi there yeah i was a little late today today's meeting um but glad to be here for the, for the end of it and see you all again i'm i'm a sometimes interloper at aes meetings i'm i, I i'm too um a, like Scott, a member of the Pacific Northwest Audio Society, and I suspect that that's why I ended up uh, getting an invite, and I appreciate it. Um, my kind of preoccupation and passion in audio is mostly uh, in uh, designing and building speaker systems, and, um, and uh, the rest of it is all just like intellectual dessert for me. So I mm. uh, appreciate being invited and appreciate being here. Thank you. Yummy. Okay, <laughs> Greg, uh, for your personal uh, introduction as compared to your, your AES introduction. Sure. Um, so I'm Greg Dixon, and um, I'm the chair of the section, as I mentioned. Um, but I work as an audio educator, and I'm currently working as assistant professor of music at DigiPen Institute of Technology in Redmond, Washington. And um, so I'm a composer and a sound designer and teach co composition and sound design there. Um, and my focus these days, uh, well, for a long time has been interactive audio applications. So building interactive systems for audio. And in, in, in the past five or six years, that has been focused almost entirely on video games. Um, so thank you. OK, sweet. Rod Evanson. Rod Evenson. Um, by profession, I'm an electrical engineer. I've worked for Tektronix uh, in the past uh, in their communications equipment division. Uh, I'm a life member of uh, AES, SMPTE, and the IEEE, uh, among other things. And I do recording work in the Portland metropolitan area uh, as a sideline. So uh, that's pretty much me. Nice. Uh, Mike Metesky. Uh, Mike Metesky. Uh, I live in Bothell, Washington, outside of Seattle. Uh, I designed and uh, own uh, Opus 4 Studios, an audio video recording uh, environment. Uh, my background is in, well, originally, <laughs> actually in math, then in music. Uh, I'm a cellist um, and uh, do a good deal of recording. Sweet. Matt Stearns. Hi, I'm Matt Stearns. Uh, I'm a Pacific Northwest Chapter Committee member and a professional audio engineer these days for Stryker, a medical company, uh, along with my cohort there, Bob Smith. He's two down the road, so we'll see you there. Rick Chen. Hi, I'm uh, the webmaster of the PNW section and a life member. And uh, when live performances come back, I'll record them. Sweet. Bob Smith. It looks like you're in Italy. <laughs> 
Secretary. Bob Smith. Okay. I'm Bob Smith. I'm an acoustic research scientist at Stryker Emergency Care. The people who make the uh, defibrillators, monitors, the paramedics, and also used in the hospital and out in the uh, front lines where the AEDs are used. And I'm also a, um, a Pacific Northwest uh, committee member, well, uh, technical contributor. And I run a laboratory at uh, my house these days to uh, continue researching all kinds of audio topics. Thank you. Mac Perkins. Yes, Mac Perkins, uh, retired theatrical sound reinforcement designer. <laughs> Did that for quite a while in addition to doing a lot of theatrical lighting systems, which the two normally fight each other, but, and currently uh, president of Pacific Studio Museum displays. Okay, thank you very much. Bob Olson. Uh, well, I've been doing this, started in sixth grade. <laughs> and, uh, you beat me by a year. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, a Nashville section committee member. And I live in Nashville, Tennessee, where I think we're all going to end up, <laughs> at least those of us in the music business. And uh, just long time, I'm, I'm a lifetime member also. <laughs> and and I these days I primarily, well, I entirely do mastering and I've been trying to adapt my clients projects to streaming and go through the usual arguments over volume volume level and it's it's been been a very interesting time all in all cool thank you very much Bob John Chester There we go, I got myself unmuted. Uh, well, uh, I live in Cambridge, Maryland. Um, 50 years ago, I was uh, in the rock and roll business doing live sound. Um, spent a while designing and manufacturing equipment for that industry, for the broadcast industry. Um, I'm do a, a bit of computer programming, I'm an analog circuit designer. And for about the past 15 years, I have done a lot of uh, maintaining and upgrading tape recorders, and I do tape transfers. I'm a right. life fellow of the AES. Okay, thank you. Steve Malott. I'm a professor emeritus of digital audio technology at Shoreline Community College. I'm on the committee and I live in Seattle. Uh, I really enjoy coming to these meetings. I've had a spell of ill health in the last couple of years uh, that involve uh, kidney transplants and other uh, non-audio issues. <laughs> uh, but I'm delighted to be here tonight and it's a very interesting topic. Thank you, JJ. So good to have you. Okay, Thank Gary you. G. Did you say Gary G? I did. That would be me. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm just here because I love the sound of JJ's voice. I could listen to those dulcet tones all day long. Uh, I am <laughs> former Eastern Vice President, uh, former Governor, former Section Chair, Secretary in different places. Currently, I am the uh, Vice Chair of the San Francisco Section. Uh, I'm also the Co-Chair of the Historical Committee and the Conference Policy Committee. So nice. I do a little here and there. I keep myself busy. And I'm thank currently you, living in uh, Ukiah, California. And thank you all so much for doing this. This was a really enjoyable discussion. It's nice to see so many familiar faces. It, it's a great opportunity for us. Okay, Dave Christie. Hi, yeah, I'm Dave Christie. Um, first, JJ, thanks so much. I'm, I've, uh, I've got 
career-wise, spent 45 years, sort of contiguous years doing stuff in tech, starting as a co-op student and uh, you know, electrical engineering. That job came to an end about you know 18 months ago, so last job. So you're next, I'm gonna I'm just diving into uh, audio engineering and trying to learn about stuff. And uh, you know, psychoacoustics is just absolutely amazing to me. Um, took a class where, you know, we had to analyze a song by Madonna called Hey Mr. DJ. There's a part in them, you know, about a third of the way in where they use uh, this Haas effect delay panning, dig into it, just a millisecond and a half is enough. Um, and it just goes all the way to the right side. So um, I'm just, I'm looking forward to the infinite challenge of uh, just, just learning more. There's so thanks, thanks for having me. Thanks for doing this stuff. Uh, joined AES. So I'm uh, just looking forward to get to know uh, some people over uh, the next few meetings. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. So Ken Dickensheets. Find the mute button here. You think I know where it is. This is Ken Dickensheets. I'm from Austin, Texas. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed the meeting tonight. I'm a life member of the AES, ASA. It's nice to see so many familiar friends and faces. Cool, welcome. Eho. Hi, Elliot Amia, and um, I'm a software, still a software architect at Microsoft in the mid 2000s. JJ and I built the audio engine in Windows. Um, no, don't and, tell them. <laughs> and early on in that stint at Microsoft, um, JJ gave all of us in the media division a series of talks. So this sounded very familiar and nostalgic for that time. And um, I miss seeing everybody at DigiPen. So it's great we get people from all over the country, but it'd be great to uh, get back in the same room again. There was an interesting uh, VR uh, presentation last summer that they had, and it almost is like being there. So at some point, we probably will be able to virtualize ourselves into a location. I look forward to that in a lot of ways. Kevin Shank. So as I mentioned in my chat intro, uh, I used to attend these 10, 15 years ago, back when I was uh, trying to be the next great successful home theater acoustically engineered designer. And that crashed and burned with the Great Recession. So I had, as they say, I had to go get a real job. Ended up in Appalachia at a military contractor doing uh, communication headsets and work with the army on a binaural mannequin head that would be uh, accurate for ANC hearing protection and communication systems uh, measurements. And we made a physical avatar of a person that was indistinguishable from himself in terms of confusion. So I know very much a lot about HRTFs and things like that from there when they folded and the mannequin never came out even though it was better than what grass and B&K are peddling nowadays. I ended up working at Harman Embedded Audio, doing products for other businesses that don't know how to do audio. And about five years ago, I got dismayed that all these dot-com companies were making speakers and what do they know about speakers? And they never want us to make the speakers for them. And like everybody else, I now work for a dot com called Facebook that's right down the road in uh, Redmond and back in the great Northwest. And I love it. Welcome back. Okay, Jess Berg. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jess Berg. I've been a live sound engineer for over 17 years, also done some broadcast and studio stuff. Uh, currently located up in Bellingham, Washington came up and born and raised in Minnesota, um, came up in the Minneapolis music scene and went to LA, toured around the world and have been up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it'll be two years this summer. So um, very, very grateful to be a member of AES now and happy to be a part of this chapter. So thanks for having me. And uh, currently I'm learning how to code. So I'm very impressed with everyone here who is way much, uh, way deeper into this than I am. I'm fascinated. So very impressed. Thank you. And a star of the Tea Time Topics to date as well. Robert Klaska, if I have that right. Paging uh, Detroit. 
Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Bob Plaza here. Uh, good to see you, JJ. Uh, I remember when you had a Detroit Section AES meeting here. And uh, I also am kind of very pleased to see that there's a number of people from the Ampex Pro Users Group, or the Ampex list as it's known. Um, I've been uh, retired from Chrysler uh, doing Jeep audio systems for seven years now and been restoring houses ever since. Keeping very active and uh, I'm glad that I could attend this uh, session, JJ. It's been very interesting and wonderful and uh, met many people again uh, in the uh, group here that uh, I haven't uh, talked to in a while. This has been great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Rick Lambright. Hi, guys. I actually used to attend um, AES meetings back when I lived in Seattle for 29 years. I'm now retired in Rancho Mirage, California. Uh, most of my time in Seattle was uh, co-founding game companies and uh, doing mostly the server side programming for, for games. My interest in audio remains uh, in electronic music. I actually used to do some uh, game music back in the day, and now I'm sort of doing my own thing and trying to retire, but not very successful at it so far. All right. Thanks so much. Florin. Hi, I'm Florin. Um, I currently work at uh, Kenworth Trucks, and I am their noise and vibrations uh, expert. Um, I started out with whole body vibrations at Caterpillar and uh, do doing work on seats, seat vibrations and things like that. Started out way down in the frequency range, you know, half a hertz to one or two hertz, and then now I'm in the uh, 10 to 20 hertz range and slowly working my way up to uh, to the kilohertz range. So great. Wow. You're soon to get to mid range. Yeah. Yeah. You are climbing frequency mountain. Um, I David Johnston. Hello. Um, yeah, I am um, David Johnston. I currently work at Microsoft in the Microsoft Research and Audio and Acoustics Research Group. Um, we've done such things as uh, like the uh, um, Windows Sonic, which is kind of a spatializing uh, plugin and some sound for HoloLens and like that. And um, before that, I was, uh, I wrote a program called Cool Edit back in the early 90s. Maybe some of you have used it. <laughs> but, and um, it since became uh, Adobe Audition. And, um, and actually you can still download it and use it. And I'm sure some of my code still survives in there. <laughs> so, um, I left the company in um, 2010 to then go to Microsoft Research. Uh, and anyway, I want to thank JJ. That was a great talk. And I always, even though I'm right in the field of spatial audio, I'm always still learning new things. So. <laughs> and, Outstanding. Thanks, David. Uh, cool. David Strait. Hi, I am David Streit. I am a recording engineer, producer, sometimes live sound engineer based in Portland, Oregon. And uh, these online meetings have been great because Seattle's a bit too far of a drive to go to an AES meeting sometimes, but it's been really nice to attend. And tonight was fascinating. Excellent, thank you. Don Hartley. Hi everyone, my name's Don Hartley. I'm an audio engineer in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. I grew up in Washington and I balance between uh, live sound and recording, and currently I'm a manufacturing representative for uh, Southern Nevada. Thank you for having me. A great uh, session tonight. Lots of wonderful information. Thank you, JJ. And thanks for being had. Ted Marsh. There we go. Unmuted. Hey, uh, hi. Sorry I've been in and out. I, I had some other commitments. Uh, Mr. Johnston, I, I would love to know, yeah, I'd love to see the whole thing. Back in the 70s, I did my master's thesis on audio localization, and I kind of figured that uh, I, I was sort of in the cheap trick side of it where we uh, worked with reverb and pan and Doppler, uh, and I, I, I guess I felt discouraged after that, that the HRTF and the ability to reverse the you know, invert the HRTF and kind of uh, superseded all of that clever stuff about ITDs and and uh, other cues. And I, I'm just sort of inspired and happy to see you talking about that stuff. I, 
I'm, I'm, I'm impressed and amazed and uh, interested. So thank you very much. Uh, right now, uh, Ted Marsh, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, Albany, California. I've been consulting in various things for a couple of decades. Uh, right now, my focus is on intellectual property. So Nice. Okay, so there's a bit of interesting things here where people have been turned on and off, so they sort of, it's it's concentration. I have to remember who we talked to. Uh, we haven't talked to Dave Quick yet. Uh, Dave, do you want to say hi? Is the mute? You're st we're still muted. Dave, Dave's over on the peninsula and building a studio. There you go. Uh, um, uh, uh, I'm Dave Quick, and I'm the musician recording engineer and programmer. Right. Excellent. Good to see you, Dave. Yeah. Okay, Scott McLaren. And if I've already called on you, then just let me know. Yeah, you already called on me. Oh, well, see, that's the thing. People are turning <laughs> up. So, and just now, now we've got a really, yes, we've got Dan Dugan who says, sorry, this room has no mic and no camera. He is an inventor in San Francisco. Now, let's see, I, I guess what we're gonna have is, I'll just, I'll call out the names I see. If I hadn't talked to you yet, unmute, Dan Mortensen. Thanks, hi everybody. Uh, I'm on the committee in Seattle here and uh, I'm the one who does the uh, Eventbrite thing that you read. So everything that's not the meeting announcement, that's all crap that I've written. And uh, it really makes, me happy to uh, see so many people from different places, but I wanted to point out that although we had 25 states, four Canadian provinces and 12 countries register, um, the actual people who showed up were 16 states, four Canadian provinces and only four countries. So it's so much easier to register and as opposed to coming at the middle of the night or first thing in the morning, but it's really awesome that someone from Scotland and someone from Hong Kong was here. So thank you for doing that. And, uh, oh, and I'm, I'm uh, part of the oral history project now. We're revitalizing the AES's oral history project. And we're just beginning to start figuring out how to do interviews. So that's proceeding though. And it's gonna be a fun project, I think. That's it. Thanks. Okay, thanks, thanks Dan. Steve. Okay, so now in order to play this game appropriately, if I haven't called on you, please unmute and then I'll call on those who have unmuted out of the non-video people. Can and I suggest some? Please do. Jessica. Jessica, Jessica? only name. Ah, is there a there's a single name Jessica besides Jesperg? Yeah. And I, she may not. Ah, oh, there she is. I there see her are. down there. Okay, Jessica. No, she's not unmuted yet. No, but I'm still going to call on her. Assuming. So that's not Rob Baum. I know we haven't heard from. Yeah. Let's hear from Rob. And and there's Tony's un, unmuted, but uh, then let's hear from Tony Ho, please. Well, so uh, Tony doesn't have a mic. Tony has a camera, but no mic. Okay. Does anyone? Okay, cool. Uh, Michael from Spokane. How about that? And it could be that everyone else is muted because they don't want to talk to us, which is fine. And in that, and I'm going to give them that opportunity not to, which is fine as well. And so with that, I think I've fulfilled my opportunity to go and call on everybody. I'm going to pass it back to Greg Dixon to do with what he wish. Thank you all very much for being here. See you soon. Thanks, Steve. Um, I guess that concludes our meeting tonight. I um, wanted to thank everybody again for being here. I'd like to extend a special thanks to JJ for the wonderful talk. Um, another round of applause. 
Not necessary. Um, thanks so much, JJ. Um, and I also want to extend my thanks to the committee for all of their help. Um, and, um, and you, every one of you for being here. Reminder, uh, next month, uh, February 23rd at 6 p.m., we're going to meet again. And we're going to hear from Bob Olson um, talking about his career in Motown. So uh, please mark your calendars. And uh, I hope that I'll see you all then. And in the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, have a great night, OK, or morning, or wherever you are. Take care. Thanks, Greg, and thanks, everybody. Take care. So long, and thanks for all the fish. Thanks, JJ. Thank you. This was fun. Thank you. <clears throat> thanks, yeah. JJ. Yeah, so no need. Bye. Thanks, Bye, JJ. JJ. Bye, guys. Sorry. Bye. I, want, well, I, I, need, I need supper. Sorry. <laughs> Go eat. I am. <laughs>